Old Yeller. Chapter 13. I was like Mama. I didn't think Elizabeth Searcy would be any help around the place. She was too little and too skinny. I figured she'd just be an extra bother for Mama. But we were wrong. Just like Bud Searcy said, she was a big help. She could tote water from the spring. She could feed the chickens, pack in wood, cook cornbread, wash dishes, wash little Arliss, and sometimes even change the prickly pear polish on my leg. She didn't have to be told either. She was right there on hand all the time, just looking for something to do. She was a lot better about that than I ever was. She wasn't as big and she couldn't do as much as I could, but she was more willing. She didn't even back off when Mama hooked Jumper to the cart and headed for the field to gather in the corn. That was a job I always hated. It was hot work and the corn shucks made my skin itch and sting till sometimes I'd wake up at night scratching like I'd stumbled into a patch of bull nettles. But it seemed, didn't seem to bother Elizabeth. In fact, it looked like she and Mama and little Arliss had a real good time gathering corn. I'd see them drive past the cabin, all three of them sitting on top of a cartload of corn. They'd be laughing and talking and having such a romping big time playing with the speckled pup that before long, <clears throat> I half wished I was able to gather corn too. In a way, it sort of hurt my pride for a little old girl like Elizabeth to come in and take over my jobs. Papa had left me to look after things. But now I was laid up, and here was a girl handling my work about as good as I could. Still, she couldn't get out and mark hogs or kill meat or swing a shopping axe. Before they were finished gathering corn, however, we were faced with a trouble a whole lot too big for any of us to handle. The first hint of it came when the spot heifer failed to show up one evening at milking time. Mom had come in too late from the corn gathering to go look for her before dark, and the next morning she didn't need to. Spot came up by herself or rather, she came past the house. I heard her first. The swelling in my leg was about gone down. I was weak as a rain-chilled chicken, but most of the hurting had stopped. I was able to sit up in bed a lot and take notice of things. I heard a cow coming toward the house. She was bawling like cows do when they've lost a calf or when their bags are stretched too tight with milk. I recognized Spot's voice. Spot's calf recognized it too. It had stood hungry in the pen all night, and now it was nearly crazy for a bait of milk. I could hear it bladding and racing around in the cow pen, so starved it could hardly wait. I called to Mama. Mama, I said, you better go let old Spot into her calf. I hear her coming. That pesky Spot, I heard her say impatiently. I don't know what's gotten into her staying out all night like that and letting her calf go hungry. I heard Mama calling to Spot as she went out to the cow pen. A little later, I heard Spot beller like a fighting bull, then Mama's voice rising high and sharp. Then here came Mama running into the cabin, calling for Elizabeth to hurry and bring in little Arliss. There was scare in Mama's voice. I sat up in bed as Elizabeth came running in, dragging little Arliss after her. Mama slammed the door shut, then turned to me. Spot made fight at me, she said. I can't understand it. It was like I was some varmint that she'd never seen before. Mama turned and opened the door a crack. She looked out, then threw the door wide open and stood staring toward the cow pen. Why, look at her now, she said. She's not paying one bit of attention to her calf. She's just going on past the cow pen like her calf wasn't there. She's acting as crazy as if she'd got hold of a beta pea vine. There was a little pea vine that grew wild all over the hills during the wet winters and bloomed pale lavender in, in the spring. Cattle and horses could eat it, mixed with grass, and get fat on it. But sometimes when they got too big a bait of it alone, it poisoned them. Generally, they'd stumble around with the blind staggers for a while, then gradually get well. Sometimes, though, the pea vine killed them. I sat there for a moment, listening to Spot. She was bawling again, like when I first heard her. But now she was heading off into the brush again, leaving her calf to starve. I wonder where she'd gotten enough pea vine to hurt her. But Mama, I said, she couldn't have eaten pea vine. The pea vine is all dead and gone this time of year. Mama turned and looked at me, then looked away. I know, she said. That's what's got me so worried. I thought of what Burn Sanderson had told me about animals that didn't act right. I said, cows don't ever get hydrophobia, do they? I saw Elizabeth start at the word. She, she stared at me with big solemn eyes. I don't know, Mama said. I've seen dogs with it, but I've never heard of a cow brute having it. I just don't know. In the next few days, while Old Yeller and I healed fast, we all worried and watched. All day and all night, Spot kept right on doing what she did from the start. 
She walked and she bawled. She walked mostly in a wide circle that brought her pretty close to the house about twice a day and then carried her so far out into the hills that we could just barely hear her. She walked with her head down. She walked slower and her bawling got weaker as she got weaker, but she never stopped walking and bawling. When the bull came, he was worse and a lot more dangerous. He came two or three days later. I was sitting out under the dog run at the time. I'd hobbled out to sit in a chair beside old Yeller where I could scratch him under his chewed off ear. That's where he liked to be scratched best. Mama was in the kitchen cooking dessert, dinner. Lisbeth and little Arliss had gone off to the creek below the spring to play with the pup and to fish for catfish. I could see them running and laughing along the bank, chasing after grasshoppers for bait. Then I heard this moaning sound and turned to watch a bull come out of the brush. He was the roan bull, the one that the droopy horned chongo had dumped into the Mexican carp the day of the fight. But he didn't walk like any bull I'd ever seen before. He walked with his head hung low and wobbling. He reeled and staggered like he couldn't see where he was going. He walked head on into a mesquite tree like it wasn't there and fell to his knees when he hit it. He scrambled to his feet and came on, grunting and staggering and moaning, heading toward the spring. Right then, for the first time since we brought him home, brought him home, Old Yeller came up off his cowhide bed. He'd been lying there beside me, paying no attention to sight or sound of the bull. Then I guess the wind must have shifted and brought him the bull's scent, and evidently that scent told him for certain what I was only beginning to su suspect. He rose with a savage growl. He moved out toward the bull, so trembly weak that he could hardly stand. His loose lips were lifted in an ugly snarl, baring his white fangs. His hackles stood up in a ragged ridge along the back of his neck and shoulders. Watching him, I felt a prickling at the back of my own neck. I'd seen him act like that before, but only when there was the greatest danger, never while just facing a bull. Suddenly, I knew that Mama and I had been fooling ourselves. Up till now, we'd been putting off facing up to facts. We kept hoping that the heifer Spot would get over whatever was wrong with her. Mama and Lisbeth had kept Spot's calf from starving by letting it suck another cow. They had to tie the cow's hind legs together to keep her from kicking the calf off, but they kept it alive, hoping Spot would get well and come back to it. Now, I knew that Spot wouldn't get well, and this bull wouldn't either. I knew they were both deathly sick with hydrophobia. Old Yeller had scented that sickness in this bull and somehow sensed how fearfully dangerous it was. I thought of Lisbeth and little Arliss down past the spring. I came up out of my chair, calling for Mama. Mama, I said, bring me my gun, Mama. Mama came hurrying to the door. What is it, Travis? She wanted to know. That bull, I said, pointing. He's mad with hydrophobia and he's heading straight for Lisbeth and little Arliss. Mama took one look and said, oh, my Lord, in almost a whisper. She didn't wait to get me my gun or anything else. She just tore out for the creek, hollering for Lisbeth and little Arliss to run, to climb a tree, to do anything, to get away from the bull. I called after her, telling her to wait, to give me a chance to shoot the bull. I don't guess she ever heard me, but the bull, the bull heard her. He tried to turn on her, stumbled, and went to his knees. Then he was back on his feet again as Mama went flying past. He charged straight for her. He'd have gotten her, too, only the sickness had his legs too wobbly. This time, when he fell, he rooted his nose into the ground and just lay there, moaning, too weak even to try to get up again. By this time, Old Yeller was there baying the bull, keeping out of his reach, but ready to eat him alive if he ever came to his feet again. I didn't wait to see more. I went and got my gun. I hobbled down where I couldn't miss and shot the roan bull between the eyes. Chapter 14 We couldn't leave the dead bull to lie there that close to the cabin. In a few days, the scent of rotting flesh would drive us out. Also, the carcass lay too close to the spring. Mama was afraid it would foul up our drinking water. We'll have to try to drag it farther from the cabin and burn it, she said. Burn it, I said in surprise. Why, we can't just leave it for the buzzards and varmints to clean up, because that might spread the sickness, Mama said. If the varmints eat it, they might get the sickness too. Mama went to put the harness on Jumper. I sent Liz Lizbeth to bring me a rope. I doubled the rope and tied it in a loop around the bull's horn. Mama brought Jumper who snorted and shielded away at the sight of the dead animal. Jumper had smelled deer blood plenty of times, so I guess it was the size of the bull that scared him. 
or maybe, like Yeller, Jumper could scent the dead bull's sickness. I had to talk mean and threaten him with a club before we could get him close enough for Mama to hook the single tree over the loop of rope I'd tied around the bull's horn. Then the weight of the bull was too much for him. Jumper couldn't drag it. He leaned into his collar and dug in with his hoofs. He grunted and strained. He pulled till I saw the big muscles of his haunches flatten and start quivering in with his hooves. He grunted and strained. He pulled till I saw the big muscles of his haunches flatten and start quivering. But the best he could do was slide the bull carcass along the ground for about a foot before he gave up. I knew he wasn't throwing off. Jumper was full of a lot of pesky, aggravating mule tricks, but when you called him, called on him to move a load, he'd move it or bust something. I called on him again. I drove him at a different angle from the load, hoping he'd have better luck. He didn't. He threw everything he had into the collar, and all he did was pop a link out of his right trace chain. The flying link whistled past my ear and with the speed of a bullet, with the speed of, the, of a bullet. It would have killed me just as dead if it had hit me. Well, that was it. There was no moving the dead bull now. We could patch up that broken trace for pulling an ordinary load, but it would never be strong enough to pull this one, even if Jumper was. I looked at Mama. She shook her head. I guess there's nothing we can do but burn it here, she said, but it's going to take us a sight of wood gathering. It did, too. We'd lived there long enough to use all the dead wood close to the cabin. Now Mama and Elizabeth had to go way out into the brush for it. I got a piece of rawhide string and patched up the trace chain, and Mama and Elizabeth used jumper to drag up big dead logs. I helped them pile the log on top of the bull. We piled them up till we had the carcass completely covered, then set fire to them. In a little bit, the fire was roaring. Sheets of hot flame shot high into the air. The heat and the stench of burnt air and scorching hide drove us back. It was the biggest fire I'd ever seen. I thought there was fire enough there to burn three bulls, but when it begged, but when it began to die down a couple of hours later, the bull carcass wouldn't wasn't half burnt up. Mom and Elizabeth went back to dragging up more wood. It took two days and nights to burn up that bull. We worked all day long each day with Mom and Elizabeth dragging up the wood and me feeding the stinking fire. Then at night, we could hardly sleep. This was because of the howling and snarling and fighting of the wolves lured to the place by the scent of the roasting meat. The wolves didn't get any of it. They were too afraid of the hot fire, but that didn't keep them from gathering for miles around and making the nights hideous with their howlings and snarlings. And all night long, both nights, Old Yeller crippled back and forth between the fire and the cabin, baying savagely, warning the wolves to keep away. Both nights I lay there, watching the eyes of the shifting wolves glow like live mesquite coals in the firelight, and listening to the weak moaning ball of Old Spot still traveling in a circle. I lay, lay there, feeling shivery with a fearful dread that brought up pictures in my mind of Bud Searcy's uncle. Sure did wish Papa would come home. As soon as the job of the burning bull was over, Mama told us we had to do the same for the spot heifer. That was all Mama said about it. But I could tell by the look in her eyes how much she hated to give up. She had great hopes for spots making us a real cow, making us real milk cow, especially after Old Yeller had gentled her so fast. But that was all gone now. Mama looked tired and more worried than I think I'd ever seen her. I guess she couldn't help thinking what I was thinking, that if hydrophobia had sickened one of our cow cows, it just might get them all. I'll do the shooting, I told her, but I'm going to follow her out a ways from the house to do it, closer to some wood. How about your leg? Mama asked. That leg's getting all right, I told her. Think it'll do it some good to be walked on. We'll try to kill her on bare ground, Mama cautioned. As dry as it is now, we'll be running a risk of setting the woods afire if there's much old grass around the place. I waited till Spot circled past the cabin again, then took my gun and followed her, keeping a safe distance behind. By now, Spot was so sick and starved I could hardly stand to look at her. She didn't look like a cow. She looked more like the skeleton of one. She was just skin and bones. She was so weak that she stumbled as she walked. Half a dozen times she went to her knees and each time I think she'd taken her last step, but she'd always get up and go on again and keep bawling. I kept waiting for her to cross a bare patch of ground where it'd be safe to build a fire. She didn't. And I couldn't drive her, of course. She was too crazy mad to be driven anywhere. 
I was afraid to mess with her. She might be like the bull. If I ever let her know I was anywhere about, she might go on the fight. I guess she was a mile from the cabin before I saw that she was about to cross a dry, sandy wash, something like the one where Yeller and I had got mixed up with the hogs. That would be a good place, I knew. It was pretty far for us to have to come to burn her, but there was plenty of dry wood around. And if I could drop her out there in that wide, sandy wash, there'd be no danger of a fire getting away from us. I'd hurried around and got ahead of her. I hid behind a turkey pear bush on the far side of the wash. But as sick and blind as she was, I think I could have stood out in the broad open without her ever seeing me. I waited till she came stumbling across the sandy bed of the wash, then fired, dropping her in the middle of it. I'd used up more of my strength than I knew, following spots so far from the cabin. By the time I got back, I was dead beat. The sweat was pouring off me and I was trembling all over. Mama took one look at me and told me to get to bed. We'll go start the burning, she said. You stay on that leg any longer and it'll start swelling again. I didn't argue. I knew I was too weak and tired to take another walk that far without rest. So I told Mama where to find Spot and told her to leave little Arliss with me and I watched her and Elizabeth head out, both mounted on jumper. Mama was carrying a pan full of live coals to start the fire with. At the last minute, Yeller got up off his cowhide. He stood watching them a minute like he was trying to make up his mind about something. Then he went trotting after them. He was still thin and rough looking and crippling pretty badly in one leg, but I figured he knew better than I did whether or not he was able to travel. I didn't call him back. As it turned out, it's a good thing I didn't. Only afterward, I wished a thousand times that I could have had some way of looking ahead to what was going to happen. Then I would have done everything I could to keep all of them from going. Will little Arliss look after? I sure didn't mean to drop off to sleep, but I did, and slept till sundown, when suddenly I jerked awake, feeling guilty about leaving him alone so long. I needn't have worried. Little Arliss was right out there in the yard, playing with a speckled pup. They had themselves a game going. Arliss was racing around the cabin, dragging a short piece of frayed rope. The pup was chasing the rope. Now and then, he'd get close enough to pounce on it. Then he'd let out a growl and set teeth into it and try to shake it and hang on at the same time. Generally, he got jerked off his feet and turned a couple of somersaults, but that didn't seem to bother him. The next time Arliss came racing past, the pup would tie into the rope again. I wondered if he wouldn't get some of his baby teeth jerked out at such rough play, but guessed it wouldn't matter. He'd soon be shedding them anyhow. I wondered, too, what was keeping Mama and Elizabeth so long? Then I thought how far it was to where the dead cow lay and how long it would take for just the two of them to drag up enough wood and get a fire started and figured they'd be lucky if they got back before dark. I went off to the spring after a bucket of fresh water and wondered when Papa would come back. Mama had said a couple of days ago that it was about that time, and I hoped so. For one thing, I could hardly wait to see what sort of horse Papa was going to bring me, but mainly... This hydrophobia plague had me scared. I'd handled things pretty well until that do that came along. Of course, I'd gotten a pretty bad hog cut, but that could have happened to anybody, even a grown man. And I was about and I was about to get well of that. But if the sickness got more of our cattle, I wouldn't know what to do.